Good evening, everyone. On behalf of uh, Virginia Tech and uh, Dominion Virginia Power, we would like to uh, we'd like to welcome you all to uh, to this event to honor the uh, uh, to honor uh, Dr. Fatke and Dr. Thorpe and to celebrate uh, some of uh, their visions that have. Uh, uh, have become a reality and are, are in the process of, uh, of, uh, of, of furthering. So we'd like to welcome all of you this evening and thank you for coming uh, tonight. I'm going to get out of the way really quickly and hand things over to, to Sandeep, who, by the way, I think did a wonderful job in, uh, in uh, kind of uh, herding all of the cats together to get this, uh, uh, to, get this to work. But uh, anyhow, thank you all. I want to talk about a few logistics for tomorrow. Uh, the symposium will be uh, at the Dominion uh, Lincoln Park 2 facility. So the symposium will not be here tomorrow. The symposium will be at the Dominion Lincoln Park 2 facility. I have a few agendas up here which have the address. That address is uh, on the same road as we're on now. That's 3072 Centerville Road. There will be a shuttle to the symposium from here that leaves at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, but there will not be a shuttle back. However, we will have... Uh, <laughs> I, think we have enough, I think we have enough cars between us all to, to, to get rides back here if we do. But uh, we also have, uh, have some taxi information available at the, uh, at the symposium site. Uh, as well, so we do have some logistics in place for that. Essentially, the way you get the, the way you get there, if you're driving, it's very simple. Uh, you go out to Centerville Road. We're facing Center, Centerville Road this way. You take a right, and you go about three miles. Then you'll see the Dominion facility uh, on your right, and it's 3072 Centerville Road. So we're on the same side of the road as this hotel, and uh, we're down the road to the west from uh, where we are now. But if you have any questions or comments on the logistics, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. So I just wanted to get a couple of the uh, uh, logistics comments out of the way, and then uh, I'll hand it over to Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, today we are going to have a few uh, uh, non uh, uh, informal uh, comments about uh, our honorees, uh, Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Fatke. And, uh, the uh, idea here is to uh, you know get started for, for a good day tomorrow, and uh, uh, so uh, I have uh, requested uh, a couple of people uh, to uh, say things uh, which are personal in nature, not about PMUs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, thankfully, uh, I have uh, um, Kony Bay, uh, Dr. Kony Bay was a student of Dr. Thorpe uh, at Cornell. Uh, she agreed to uh, talk, uh, and uh, also uh, Jaime Delaray, who uh, knows a lot about their past. Uh, uh, so uh, that's going to be uh, the the second one. And Manu, are you, are you talking? Sure. Yeah. yeah so Manu Parashar uh, from Alstom, uh, who is uh, who was also a student of Dr. Thorpe, uh, will uh, share uh, his experience of uh, being grilled by by Jen. Uh, as a student, uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Bob Thomas, uh, another Cornell colleague. Uh, I hope he was not grilled by Jim. But Jim was, uh, uh, Jim was uh, uh, chair, department chair. Uh, but uh, before we start, I want to say a few things. Uh, I'm, uh, most of you don't know me because I'm not a, a power system uh, professor. I, I'm actually uh, from computer engineering. But uh, uh, due to uh, Jim's arrival at Virginia Tech, uh, uh, a lot of things changed. I kind of uh, pour it uh, into the area of uh, communication and networking and, and, and power system, PMU kind of area. And I want to say uh, one thing which is uh, not so much roasting, it's a, a little bit serious note. Uh, the reason why I, I was so interested in doing this, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Fatke uh, retired the year after I came. So uh, I didn't Did know his. Uh, I didn't cause it. I was too, <laughs> too new to, to cause such upheavals in the department. But uh, 
Uh, but I knew him more after I knew uh, Professor uh, Thor when he came. And, and the, the, I will tell you one thing that, uh, uh, so uh, the, the way Dr. Thorpe changed the department, uh, so I, I, I've been in the department for 11 years, and my first two years in the department, I always uh, applied to other places. Uh, it was so bad. So when Dr. Thorpe came, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with Dr. Farke. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I will just uh, give you a quotation that Jawaharlal Nehru said about the arrival of Gandhi in the Indian political scene, which was, he was like a powerful current of fresh air that uh, made us stretch ourselves and take deep breaths, like a beam of light that pierced through the darkness and removed the scales from our eyes, like a whirlwind that upset many things, but most of all, the working of people's minds. So, so Dr. Thorpe actually changed the culture, the working of the department, drastically, which has made Virginia Tech DC department far, far better in my opinion. And that has made uh, my life easier. I, I decided to stick to Virginia Tech, and it's been 11 years. And uh, in, the, in the meantime, I also got to know a lot about power system uh, through, through him and, and, and uh, did some work myself. So, so uh, that made uh, uh, you know, myself indebted to, to Dr. Thorpe uh, in a big way. So, so that's why uh, it's very, my personal gratitude also is mixed in this uh, organization of this event. And of course, Matt Gardner has been an excellent partner in this crime. Uh, with me, so uh, this is, uh, uh, has been a great uh, work with him. So I will uh, give it to Connie, uh, so she will talk and then uh, uh, Jaime will say something and disprove my theory of uh, the department. <laughs> Sorry for the water bottle, but I brought the Texas plague and I probably need to Good evening. My name is Kelly Bay, and I'm with the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Um, I'm incredibly honored and thankful for the opportunity to, to join you here today to celebrate the amazing Jim Thorpe. It's been a privilege to be mentored by this man for over 20 years. We met at Cornell where he was my advisor during my days as an undergraduate, and that was only the beginning. I know that I can always expect him to return my calls. And these days, that kind of reliability is a hard to find rarity, but not from him. When I was asked here to speak on behalf of such an incredible man, I felt grateful for the chance to thank him so dearly for being such a positive leader. So this is my heartfelt thank you letter to you, Professor. Professor Thorpe, thank you. Even after more than a decade of leaving your side, there are very few weeks that go by that I do not have my what will Jim Thorpe do moments. And this week, the wheels are turning as we speak. Um, I watched you stick up for the little people, especially the brilliant, and those often misunderstood because of that brilliance. And I would like for you to know that I do stick up for those people. Thank you. I have told you many times that I have imparted Thorpisms, and I know this is not the first time you're hearing about that, to many, and I think I can safely say across the world. Some are still students, and others are entrepreneurs making their way into the world. They all face challenges and often loneliness in being pioneers. You always said that that would be true, especially the loneliness part. Um, but you also said to go with your guts and make people believe. So sir, um, if you can wait another five to 10 years, you will hear about innovations from young entrepreneurs who probably have one thing in common their love for martinis. <laughs> Thank you. As much as you are my complete inspiration 
for everything technical. And that includes the 1970s um, technical IEEE paper on the optimal tracking <laughs> that we reference still in my field. Um, the hows and the whats of breaking down a complex problem. But my day-to-day -day evolution in the professional setting came from watching and listening to you on how you listen and how you let. That listening part, um, that has been my survival skill uh, in keeping it relevant in a corporate setting that I find myself in. That Jim Thorpe nuance that I picked up from watching you has team from different cultures and governments are gaining and finding concurrence. So thank you. You taught us to think like you and most importantly, perhaps not necessarily be you. And that's one sub subtly that I appreciate and love even more and more. Um, it's been an, an absolute privilege to have been your student and your mentee, your service to your field, your commitment to your team, and that unwavering energy. I still don't know how you get up at, is it four o'clock in the morning <laughs> after retirement? It's ungodly hours, as I call it. Um, those are my own to-do and to-be's. Um, one item. I still have not cracked the code on how to speak in public like you. Um, I, we, as students, we often told you that's just this unnatural presence that you have. But back in 1995, in your office, you said to me, Give it time, it will come when I'm ready. So thank you again, and that's from all of us who have the privilege. Um, hi, hi, me. I can speak loudly. Speak loudly? Oh, God. Can I do that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I hope you can hear me back there. I, normally, I, I tend to speak loud. I, I've been told that a few times before in my life. It was uh, 1984. I was graduating from the University of Pittsburgh with my PhD, and uh, a fellow by the name of Leo Grigsby, I was talking to Howard Hamilton, my advisor, suggested but perhaps uh, this new graduate who was about to finish a pit should interview at Virginia Tech. During that visit, I had the opportunity, the privilege, the honor to be interviewed by Professor Aaron Fadke. Fadke was on, on the committee. Uh, they were looking for more people to enhance the power group at Virginia Tech. Everybody makes mistakes. He hired you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. The, the, out of the words of Howard B. Hamilton, he says, uh, one of the things that you got to learn in life is that honesty is one thing you should know how to accomplish. But once you learn how to fake it, you are on your way to success. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I joined Virginia Tech in 1984 as a, as a junior faculty, long hair, braces. Uh, I came to interview, and, and, I, and I had the opportunity in the, by an invitation by Professor Patti Arun to join the group of research in power and decided to start learning a little bit about these new ideas that he was working with, PMUs. It was right at the beginning, I remember. We were using a Motorola 68020 MISO communication board. Uh, we were using uh, data acquisition from data translation. Miroslav Begovic, right there, was a young student next to uh, professor now, Virgilio Centeno as well, and they were putting together the first BMU of those times. Uh, we still have the, the remains of that in, in our lab. It's, 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 it's with honor that when I have visitors, I take them there, and I show them the new equipment, and I show them the history. It was later, in 1989, I believe, 8990, that Professor Jim Thorpe came to Virginia Tech to give us a talk on what he was working at the time, potential energy boundary services. 
one of his students, I don't remember the name, uh, and I'm, I'm sure if I try to pronounce it, I will mispronounce it. But you were there, and you were talking to us about potential energy boundary surface. I had a student, and we went on to write a paper that somehow is a little bit against that. And you, and you told me that day, be easy on the name. Some people may not like what you are writing. But from you, Jim, I learned a whole lot. Later, when, when Jim came to Virginia Tech, as uh, Sandeep in here indicated in 2004, to interview, he decided to ask me to work with him as assistant department head. I, I didn't want to do any of those things. I told him I'm not an administrator. I'm fine doing my teaching, working on a little bit of research. I'm happy with that. He says, there is something here for you, he says. You, you indicated that I could be a candidate. If I do a great job, people are going to say, Jaime brought us a great guy. If, you do a, if I do a crummy job, Jaime brought us a, the wrong guy. So you got to work with me on this one. So with an arm twist, three margaritas, and a bunch of people trying to convince me, uh, I accepted and I joined uh, the administration and the department. One thing that I learned from you, Jim, and I uh, have used it a lot during my time, is you told me gentle pressure in the direction you want to move. And people will move in that direction with you. Gentle pressure, don't do sudden changes. And I've been doing that. After you, you retire, I still keep coming to your office and asking questions from time to time. Your guidance has been invaluable to me. Uh, but beside that, you know, we are here to honor you about phasers and things like that. Sandeep indicated that when you got there, it was, fr it was a spread of fresh air, new, new light, to the point that the guy got blinded altogether and decided to take my classes. How many classes did you take with me? Like three, what, three, three. three or four classes. Sandeep sat in my classroom with the rest of my students. Um, he antagonized with the students all the time. Uh, from time to time, he used to say, shut up. Um, but, uh, he decided to move in the direction of power, and he's done a great job. And it's an honor to, to work with you as well, Sandeep. Um, in terms of uh, things that happened during the time when I was there, I remember one time that we had a, a graduate student that came from Arizona, joined Virginia Tech, and he came to my office to talk to me. I'm gonna skip the name, but anyway, the guy was from India, really, really, really heavy accent. I couldn't understand a thing the guy was telling me. So I decided, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this guy to Fat King. <laughs> Fat King's from India. <laughs> this fellow's from India. They're going to understand each other. So I did. I went with his office. Uh, so when we sat down there, we, we talked. I, that's what I believe we were doing. And, uh, and then after a little while, we say goodbye, and the guy left the room. And I close the door, and I don't look at me, and he says, we got a problem. He says, what's the problem? He says, I don't understand this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the guy, the guy graduated and joined a company in Texas. Uh, and one day, you and I fly through Houston, had the opportunity to see him once again. His English much, much better. His problem was that he taught, and he spoke really, really fast. And you wouldn't understand a thing he was saying. It sounded almost like me. You know, I'm a Mexican and came across the border, didn't speak any English, learn English in the bars in Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> that's not elaborate anymore, my wife is sitting right there. Um, anyway, and, uh, and the other one that, that I remember really well is when Jim moved to Virginia Tech, you know, he came with all his tools to do woodwork. And, and I used to like to do some woodwork, and I, I do it from time to time. So one day I decided I was going to make a frame for this paint that actually was painted by, by Arun, but I made the frame <coughs> on Jim's shop. So I bought solid red oak and I started working on it. And he has this really nice miter compound saw that does a great job. Okay, so I'm measuring and I'm cutting. And, and he's just looking over my shoulder what I'm doing, and, and I measure it again, and I put it again, and I cut, and I'm cutting something that was what he considered was a hairline. Uh, and he says, 
don't you know anything about sandpaper? <laughs> so he was trying to teach me. <laughs> but at the end, I made this frame, which was like about 40 some inches by 30 some inches. And then when I put it on the, on the frame and I, and, I, and I stretch it, he came out with a 90, a straight 90, and he started measuring the 90s. And the answer was? 90. 90. So he thinks that I'm obsessive compulsive. I think you're right. <laughs> and the other one was one day that I, we were in his house and we were making margaritas. I'm infamous for that, I think. I sent everybody to sleep after some margaritas. And I started uh, mixing, but somehow the ice was not coming out of the door. So after fixing some margaritas, the, the, the old-fashioned way, you know, just scooping the ice out, out, of, out of the refrigerator, I decided something is wrong here. So I started looking at the refrigerator, and after a little while, I figured out that the switch, that when you close the door, was not actually cutting all together. It was not closing. So I went downstairs into his shop. I took a piece of plastic, a pair of scissors. I cut this piece of plastic. I took some duct tape, taped it to the door someplace, closed the door, put the thing, and here comes the ice. It worked beautifully. And I left. Margaritas. We had margaritas all night long, Jim. Am I right about that? To this day, he has not let me live out of it. He went on, sat down, and started looking. Why is it that he needed to put a piece of plastic to fix this? And I think it drove him crazy for quite some time until he figured out that one of the trays was actually installed wrong. And to this day, he tells me that I am kind of a practical engineer, but I don't really look for the root of the problem. <laughs> it is, with no doubt, it's been a pleasure, it's been an honor to be with Jim and Arun all these years. I learned so much from them. One, one of the things I remember that scared me to death, one time when our good friend Sven Horowitz decided he was not going to go to Brazil, to teach a course here. I think CB didn't want him to go to Brazil anymore after something happened in the middle of the street. Let's not get into details on that one. Okay. Uh, but I, I went with Arun to teach in Brazil and, and trying to fill up the shoes of somebody like Stan Horowitz, I, I tell you, it, it's, it's, it is a task. And I, I know that I didn't do it, but I went with Arun to, to teach and it was just an honor to be with him there. Uh, it's an honor to be work with you, Jim, as well. I learned so much from both of you. I imagine that everybody in this room had stories to tell. Back there is Mr. Mark Adamic sitting. It's Mark, you, I'm sure you have tons of stories from the past. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll be there to listen to them. Thank you for to both of you from, from all of us, and very personally from, from me and my family. You've been part of it, uh, and we hope to continue consider part of our family. Thanks. I was informed uh, Damir Dabosel uh, from Quantum uh, Technology will say a uh, few words. Two minutes ago, I should say a few words. But considering uh, how much I learned from Jim and Arun, I think it's really not a problem for me to say a couple of words. Firstly, I want to say uh, how I met Arun. Uh, I was actually, I just joined ABB, and uh, my boss at that time thought that I need some help, and he was absolutely right. So he brought Arun. Uh, to meet with me and be my mentor. And I thought that was the best thing this guy would, had uh, done in his life because it really uh, changed my life by having Arun as my mentor. But what was interesting, uh, I must say this story. So uh, Arun told me that story later uh, when, when uh, he told John that uh, he would be meeting with me, he asked him where did he graduate from. Damir graduated from Mississippi State University. And Aron says, why would you bring the guy from Mississippi State University? To <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, I'm sure that Aron now uh, regrets his... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I must say that, uh, again, was, was uh, really changed my life. And I always remember when Aron and Kusum would come to Raleigh, and spent time with my family, my two daughters, and my wife. 
we would actually, um, for whatever reason, we would go to pizza place. <laughs> I remember that very well, I guess because of the two girls. They liked uh, food like pizza and so on. Uh, and then, of course, I was very privileged to have a chance to meet Jim. And uh, uh, Jim became my other mentor. Uh, and, uh, I, of course, um, there are certain things that I didn't do well in life, and now you know which people to blame for what I didn't do good. Uh, but there are a couple of things that I, I and I don't want to be too long, but I want to say a couple of things that I learned from both Jim and Arun. Uh, one was the teamwork. Uh, uh, we very often forget and think that by putting ourselves first and uh, uh, doing individual work, we are stronger, but it's just the other way around. It's actually by working as a team, doing things together, we really achieve what we need to uh, achieve and help the industry and, and help at the end of the day ourselves. So it was no wonder that both Jim and Arun got the Franklin Award together. I think that was the first time in the history that this uh, award, Nobel Award for engineers was awarded to two people. And uh, it really, again, I'm, I'm repeating that word now, changed my life, but that's really the truth. Because, you know, you, you think sometimes, you know, you want to, and you guys know me here, I'm a pretty aggressive guy, trying to drive things and so on, but that's what I really learned. That the only way to succeed, if you have your colleagues, friends, and do things together, I mean, we look into this PMU community. I can tell you this group here, each of you guys had a major role in moving things forward. We give credit, of course, to the, the guys that started. Without, without Fat Key and Torp, would not have happened. But people here, again, I'm always afraid to start, you know, saying names because I'll forget somebody. But at the end of the day, for example, without Phil Overall, I can pick up Phil. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Uh, we would not have got this, all these uh, SmartGrid investment grants that are now, uh, we have all these PMUs and all the stuff. So each of you guys here can step back and think how we as a team have managed. But that's the key message that I got from, from uh, and actually, I want to say Stan. I do want to <coughs> emphasize that I always saw these three guys. It's, it's amazing you have that, uh, and uh, these guys argue, by the way. It's not like <laughs> they're just so nice to each other. They argue and discuss, but that's the, the creative juices are flowing by having these three guys working together and bringing the best in all of them. Because we all have our strengths. And by putting these three guys together, I think that was, that was the key. And my last, my last story will be, and again, there are lots of stories, but I think it's probably time to, for me to stop. See, you didn't expect that, that I would now continue talking about that long. But the, the story was, once I was complaining to Arun, I said, you know, we, Arun taught me to appreciate the value of phase measurements, okay? So I started implementing this at ABB at that time. And there were lots of resistance. People are saying, why would you do this? I mean, this makes no sense. You know, there were, even somebody said there was this professor that said, you only need uh, 10 PMUs, you can have full observability of the grid, or some stupid things like that, okay? So why would we as a company do that business? And I was persistent, working with my colleagues here in the room, and we developed that device and all the stuff, and things started suddenly picking up a little bit. So there is this guy coming to the meeting and said, you know, we developed this device and I'm so glad we did it, I did it. So he was kind of promoting himself and not giving any credit to other people. So I said, look at what's happening here. You know, the guy was the biggest obstacle. Now when things are kind of picking up and getting better, now the guy takes all the credit. <laughs> and Arun says, please don't worry about those things. These guys take credit from other people. And they can never do it again. But the people... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, well. What can we do? <laughs> so, it, so uh, but you can do it again. 
So you will be able to develop new ideas. So just don't worry about these guys. Just continue doing what you are doing. And again, that was a couple of lessons that I learned, and uh, I, I think that made me a, a better person. Thank you, guys. From Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, like Demir, Sandeep told me about 20 minutes ago that, hey, Manu, why didn't you get up and say something about because of the Jim Thorpe? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really fortunate and honored to have had Jim Thorpe as my mentor. Uh, I was a graduate student since 1997 to 2003, and as I think about those uh, six years, some very vivid memories of that time. The first memory I have is entering Professor Jim Tharp's office. Now, uh, the, the reality is I was an undergrad student, okay, thinking of joining Cornell as a grad student, and Coney Bay here was one of my uh, teaching uh, assistants. And so I walked up to her office and I said, hey, you know, where do I learn more about what we are doing here? And she said, why don't you go and job talk to Professor Jim Thorpe? And I walk into Jim Thorpe's office and here you have a six plus tall man and he was the, the department head wearing his tie and suspenders. Very intimidating for an undergraduate student, okay? And I started a, a senior project with him and by the end of that project, I realized what a gentle man this person is. So, so that's one data point for Professor Thorpe. Now, I was happy to join as a graduate student, and we would have our weekly meetings with him. Every Friday, I'd meet with him after lunch for an hour. And, you know, what? one thing I, I clearly remember and appreciate is his style of mentoring. So, he'd leave you alone, Okay, and it was that one hour that he'd sit with you and talk to you. And, and I must admit, I, I, I took liberty of that, that flexibility, especially the year I, I met my wife, then my girlfriend. Uh, I don't think I spent too many hours in the office that year. Uh, but anyways, uh, that, that Friday afternoon, I'd walk into his office, right, and walk in with, with a problem. And he'd pull out this yellow piece of paper, and he'd sit with you, and within that half an hour, one hour, you know, he'd solve your problem for you. Okay, and I was just amazed at how, you know, I've spent this whole week doing this, and, and then within that hour, he solves that problem for me. And then at the end of it, he goes, you know, Manu, I'm really glad you thought of that. And he, you know, there was this <laughs> humbleness. He would give the credit back to you. You know, and, and so as, as, as I think about it, you know, my, my father, he's a professor, and one of the things he's mentioned, uh, and I remember he said, you know, when we are alive, we are known by the company that we keep. And after us, we are known by the graduate students that we meet, right? Uh, in, in, in some ways, uh, Professor Tharp has influenced me. You know, my style of working with my own colleagues, the teamwork, working with, with uh, people I mentor. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really fortunate that myself and other people here uh, have the privilege of moving some of his vision related to synchrophases forward. You know, it, it's an honor to have these guys mentor us and then the be in this industry to move that forward. So thank you, Professor Thorpe, and thank you, Professor Fatke, you know, for having blessed our, our life. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bob Thomas. Uh, and I saw Barilio walk in, so I'm going to uh, ask him to say a few words after. I have some pictures. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh.
Well, good evening. It's a, a real pleasure to be here um, and to uh, celebrate, along with the rest of you, the uh, careers and accomplishments of Ruth Becky and, and Jim Thorpe. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I always wondered about that question because if you ask it, it sort of implies you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to say no? <laughs> um, this one. Wednesday. This is Wednesday. Anyway, uh, let me just start by uh, by saying that uh, Jim and I were colleagues at uh, Cornell for before he left uh, for for BPI, excuse me, Virginia Tech. Uh, in, uh, in uh, 2004, right? uh, for 32 years. We had offices next door to each other uh, for all of that time. Sometimes Jim was never there. He was down being a department head. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we really were colleagues for that long. Uh, he hired me at Cornell in 1973 uh, when I first came there. A Rumi came and he and Kasum came to uh, campus. The first time I met uh, Arun was in 1982 when the two of them were there for the summer. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Uh, but you know what? What a what a gifted pair of people. Um, the, it, technically and in every other way. I mean, it's just a, as you've heard before, just a, a, a tremendous experience uh, working with, with both. But I wanted to talk a little bit, because I know Jim so well, and uh, Aaron and I, Arun and I, uh, after that summer, it's unfortunate, and I'll explain to, uh, tomorrow a little bit, that our, our paths sort of diverged. Um, and and uh, we see each other, but uh, you know we, we haven't worked technically together since then. But Jim and I have uh, for, for all of that, that, uh, that time. So we could go to the next. So I would like to tell you a little bit about the real Jim Thorpe. Uh, and uh, here, these are some pictures from. And I don't know if you can see them very well. Um, when he was at Cornell, this is back in the in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, this is uh, Jim in his office that the Manu talked about going into on the left. The uh, things that he had in his office were a lighter, cigarettes, a cup of coffee, and uh, he was known in the department as the clean desk man. Uh, as you can see here, his desk is a little not so clean, but uh, at that point in time, he was uh, working hard on lots of different problems. Um, in his hand, you'll see, uh, do you know, everybody know what a singular pencil is? When I met Jim in 1973, he was what our good friend and colleague Terry Fine would say, sharpening his singular pencils. <laughs> a singular pencil is a, is a matrix concept, singular matrix concepts, and Jim was working hard on that when I, when I first met him. If you go to the International Journal of Control in 1973, you'll, you'll find the most fascinating paper on singular pencils. I think that's the last pencil you sharpen. Right? <laughs> Uh, after that, uh, he, he really did immerse himself in the, in the, in the power field. Which, uh, uh, there, were, there were four of us in the group in 73. Jim, uh, Chris Pottle, and uh, Sam Link. By the way, Chris Pottle passed away a few years ago. Sam Link is now in his 92, I think he is, still around. Myself and Jim. That was our group. Um, on the right is uh, Jim working with one of his graduate students, John McClure. Uh, they were working on a project called Industry Functional Modeling. This came out of DOE and Les Fink. We still don't know what that means, <laughs> but we worked on it. Um, that's, that's Jim's style, right? Uh, working with his graduate students. Uh, in the bottom left is the Kettering Energy Laboratory that was established at Cornell. Uh, some of those uh, uh, things behind, behind Jim, those racks of electronics, Aaron designed those as his pie sections. Uh, I was working uh, on building with one of my students, uh, Steve McMinn, building a, uh, uh, a real-time um, 
synchronous generator model in microprocessor technology to integrate with that. Aaron worked with, uh, with Steve uh, on that project. And some of the original finite, uh, uh, the, the um, floating point arithmetic that was done in the early, um, uh, in the early uh, uh, measuring units came out of that project. So that's Jim in front of electronic equipment, in case you've never seen him that way before. <laughs> Next one. Um, and of course, anybody that knows Jim knows about his passion for golf. It says at the bottom, if you can't read it, hold these, I have to go back for my wife. I think that's exactly the way he felt about golf. <laughs> but he had a lot of other hobbies too, and uh, I mean referred to the woodworking, but um, he's also a, I think a, a very accomplished painter was back. And these were things that he would do, uh, you know, back even even in the early days at Cornell, he would develop these things. But I want to talk about this excellent storyteller thing for a minute. Those of you that know him know of his love for telling stories. And the ones that I really liked is the ones he used to tell about himself. And uh, I know he's, what he's going to say. He's going to say, let me tell it. I can tell it better. <laughs> you, you, you sit there and listen. <laughs> so he, he went to uh, AEP, where he first met Arun, in, what was it, 1976, somewhere around there. He uh, was on a, on a sabbatical, went, went to uh, AEP every week. So he'd get out of class. Thursday afternoon, he'd get in his Ford Galaxy, was it? <laughs> Ford Galaxy, was this red, black, big thing. He's like a boat. And he used to drive it down to Patterson, New Jersey, where he would spend the night in a, in a motel. Then he'd get on the PATH train, and he'd drive into Wall Street, do his thing, whatever it was, uh, working on a computerized substation project, get on the train, go back, and pick up his car. Well, his car was, it was sort of old, and, uh, not in the greatest shape, and he was he was thinking he would he would trade it in. But it was a winter, so he he uh, uh, would would get to the motel at night, and it was cold, and his battery wasn't exactly in great shape. So Mark told me to do this. Mark Adami. Oh, Mark Adami, I told you. That. <laughs> so so he would he he would open up the hood, take the battery, take it into the motel, and sleep with it. <laughs> then in the morning, then he, <laughs> then he would come back at, at night and he'd put the battery back in the car and he'd drive home. Well, one night he's, he's, he's back and he's got the battery and he's putting it into the car and he, and he gives the car a jig one. And so uh, uh, he looks around back and here's this guy with a crowbar trying to open his trunk. And he goes back there and he says, what are you doing back there? And he says, well, you're getting the battery, I'm going to get the spare tire. <laughs> but he would come back with a litany of this stuff. Every week, I would look forward to the current adventure story. <laughs> stories about cockroaches, stories about whatever. Anyway, it was just incredible. And, but I love listening to those stories, and, and it's you know, it, it's it's almost like you know, it, it, it's the same way he teaches. You know, he makes it fun, he makes it interesting. He uh, he is a great storyteller, and that's one of the things I really miss. We uh, don't seem to have too many of those left at Cornell anymore. Maybe me, I don't know. Um, we had offices adjacent to each other for over 31 years. We co-advised in the neighborhood of 20 PhD students. We co-authored over 50 papers together, and none of them had anything to do with synchro papers. <laughs> that was a different life for me. He and I worked on other things, and you know, it, I guess I can't express uh, uh, how enjoyable all that was. Um, it was just an incredible career. I'm, I'm grateful for you hiring me at Cornell. I'm grateful for my career. I never thought I would end up uh, here, and uh, I owe you a great deal. And uh, Arun, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure knowing you over all these years as well. Thank you.
think that's my <laughs> Uh, are you on, on the spot here? <laughs> Thanks for the ambush. Um, <laughs> but, but I guess it, it, it does make sense. Uh, <clears throat> my case is unique. In 1985, I was a senior trying to decide on which area of electrical engineering to study. And we just got the new professor of Virginia Tech that came from AP. He was teaching a protection class, not interested. I decided to take it. And that, in a way, changed uh, my life. I took his class. It was hard, but it was a lot of fun. And when I was taking his class, he mentioned one day, you, know, you, you probably should try to go to grad school, something I really didn't plan for. I was uh, six months away from graduation, and I wanted to go back to my home country and you know, grad school. You know, I come to the United States because it was four years versus five years in other places. And, you know, grad school didn't sound attractive. So next semester, I was ready to go. I called my dad, and he said, listen, things are really bad here. You should uh, try to do something else. Anything you do, I don't want you to come back. So you remember that professor who told you to do grad school? You should go and talk to him. So I went and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in grad school. And I wasn't at the moment, but you know, there was an opportunity. And he said, well, you work for me for six months, and then you do a good job, and then I consider giving you a GRA. That was when the synchrophase project was started. And uh, I said, OK. So there was a, an old computer I brought with him, an old uh, PDP-11. He said, well, what you have to do is get all the server things out of this uh, computer and put it on this tape. If you can do that, then you will. So I started working on it and, and reading and trying to learn about it. But uh, we had to wire wrap it to do something else. And one day we had a meeting. I told him, well, yes, I'm advancing, but I really don't know how to wire wrap at this point. And he said, yes, come with me. So we went. He sat with me and he showed me how to wire wrap this computer so we can get the information out of it. And did that and I say, yeah, where do you learn that? He said, well, you learn all the trade. You have to learn all from the basic all the way on. I said, oh, great. So wire up it, work on it, got my information out, and he offered me a GRA to work on the synchrophase project that we have funded by DOE. And that's when I met Virosaf who's here. I remember Arvin Chopin and Viru Rufani Raj who is not here. And some other guys, which we used to have a lot of fun in the lab. And this is where the fun times of our life, but he really makes it work hard. I, mean, I remember we used to have a, one day a week where we met with him. And there were the meeting with him, the meeting we have among our, ourselves before, and the meeting we have after the things. And we always sit there before and say, you know, this guy really makes it work hard. He's a late driver. Now we, gotta, we gotta tell him, you know, this is too much of another. And then we go and meet with him. And then we all come back and we always had the same feeling. We always go with him, we are upset, and we come out of that office and we feel like we haven't done enough. And that was true. We always, you know, had that discussion after him. How does he does it? He really controlling us here. He's doing something with us, but he always makes it all hard. And I think the reason we, we kept doing it was because it was fun and, and he set the examples on what to follow. And it was really fun time and, and a lot of things. And, and in a way, I was privileged because I, I got to see the changes. You know, he had come from AP, and he used to wear this uh, three-piece three suit with him all the time. I remember other guys coming, and, and they would come to the grass students and ask questions, not to him. And one day I told one, you should just go and ask him. You know, he's really good. He, you've got to explain your really well things and all that. He's really nice person. Yeah, but he wears a suit. <laughs> so serious. And it was true. And it took him about five, six years to, to drop pieces of the suit. Now you hardly ever see him with a suit there. That's cool. Big change. But it was a big change for, for me too. I, I learned to love what I was doing. I was glad that what came by chance, you know, actually became something I really enjoyed doing. 
And I didn't realize, you know, how well known he was until I, I went to work with Jay Murphy at Marconi. And one day he had brought some Oriental visitors who were looking at this. And he said, yo, this is Virginia Sutton, he's working with me. And they go, wow, and I bow back and he said, he's a student of Dr. Fakir. And I go, ooh, and they all come and shake my hand. <laughs> so I make sure I mention that, that anonymously <laughs> after that. But I learned a lot uh, from Dr. Fakir, especially on, on, you know, always try to do your best. If it doesn't work, it's not failure. It's just some learning that you have to go back and start again. And he used to tell me that. He used to go to his office and all that. It didn't work. Okay, back to the drawer and we start the whole process again. And that's the way you learn. And that's one, you have a lot of the grad students who were with him here. It's nice to see you was coming to the hotel, but so all of them coming back home. Anyway, it was not only fun, but it was uh, interesting in, in many ways. I remember one day where I walk out of the lab and there's this Lincoln-like guy with a cast on his right leg coming in and I knew from the pictures of the book that I was Dr. Tork <coughs> and he gave us a nice seminar and I still hasn't changed much except for the color of the hair but yeah, thanks. And I was so fortunate that I, I came back to Virginia Tech, got to work with Dr. Faki there again and then Dr. Tork came back and I started working and for the past uh, 13 years I, I've been working with these guys. Uh, with you know, in, in the time where the secret faces are really coming up. And it's been a really beautiful experience. I think that the, the best time we ever had with this one was when we, we had to go to Brazil to give a presentation to the research group there for the power company. And it, it was fun and it, it was interesting and it's, it's great to see the reaction of the people. Um, first of all, you know, just the day before we leave, you know, Jim called me and he said, do you know this hotel you reserved for? It's known as a gay hotel in Rima. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there was nothing we could do about it. We said, well, that's OK. We're all married. We should go there. We have excuses. So we went there. Uh, have fun. It, it, it was a, a gay hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but remember going to the presentation of the center in Brazil and I'm sitting there and they're talking and the property comes and start talking and then there's this old lady, it's a researcher there at the center. She's sitting behind me and she's telling her friend and, and my Portuguese was so so thanks to my wife and but uh, I, I can clearly distinguish what she's telling me and her friend she said you gotta take a picture of me. This guy is my hero. I really need a picture of this guy. You know, to make sure you get it and I want to get a picture and all that. It, and all the time he's talking, you know, she never listened to the thing. <laughs> Just talking about Dr. Flacky and how he was his heir hero and all that she learned about him and all that. She was a PhD also, and she was in her 40s. You know. It looks like, you know, a groupie from a rock band trying to get a picture with all the things. And she went and, and you know, took her picture and all those things. But that's, that's the way it was with this guy. So, you know. For me, it's been a privilege you know, to be there. It's been a privilege to have both of you as mentors. My father passed away in 85, I remember, and this guy's came up for me to that place. They always guide me, they always help me with good advice, not only professionally, but in, into my family, and I always will really appreciate that. And I just want to take the thank you from my heart. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, unless there is somebody who wants to say something more, we can go back and have our drinks and and and, <laughs> and uh, tomorrow please be uh, there at 7:30. Uh, the bus will be uh, not the bus. Two vans will go and then there will be enough cars. So uh, you know we'll be starting early and tomorrow is a very bad day. So so we have to do it uh, uh, very quick. Uh, you know early <coughs> Friday. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking time instead of drinking and, and chatting. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, let's uh, 
continue with the party.